Hey Heartland, Kathy Sweeney joining you live from Tallapoosa, Missouri in New Madrid County. I'm on 2nd Street and if you can see behind me, there are a number of state and county investigators on scene. They are at a home here on 2nd Street and they are here because the sheriff says they received a tip about possible evidence in the house behind me connected to the 2006 disappearance of New Madrid County mom Teresa Butler. You may recall her case back in 2006. The mother of two went missing basically in the middle of the night, January of 2006. Her husband was working a night shift and when he came home the next morning, he found their two young sons, ages four and two, home alone and Teresa was nowhere to be found. Now investigators have told us that there were no signs of a struggle in the house, that they do believe that at least one person was in that house the night that Teresa disappeared and they've basically been working her case ever since that day following lots of leads. You might recall we profiled the case on Heartland Unsolved back in 2017. When we did that we learned that investigators did have at least one suspect identified they told us and we also learned about a key piece of evidence you might recall. Police found a camcorder that they believe came from the Butler home they had a witness tell them that the camcorder was involved in some kind of a drug deal. Uh, but that's about all the evidence that they had. So again, this big update happening right now here in Tallapoosa. We watched earlier as uh, construction crews and investigators went inside the home. We saw investigators bringing out several large pieces of plywood and what would appear to be some kind of flooring material, chunks of flooring material. You can't see it from here, but they're gathering it and putting it in the back of one of those uh, state police pickup trucks you see there behind me. So obviously a very big break in this case. Uh, this has been a real high priority case here in New Madrid County. And, and over the years, I've been following kind of both cases in tandem, both Teresa's disappearance and of course the murders of Sherry and Megan Shear in Portersville. That case just closed last October. Now this cold case it seems to be heating up again with the work you see here behind me. So I know a lot of you have messaged me over the years about Teresa, about uh, your memories of her. You worked with her. You went to school with her. Um, by all accounts, a great mom would have never left her home and left those two young boys home alone. Um, so uh, they've always conducted this uh, cold case investigation as a very high priority one. And again, as you see today, some, some new activity going on behind us. So investigators got out here probably a little before 10 o'clock. I will tell you that this home, it's hard to see because of the tree line, but it's actually a rental home. And so the current occupants of this home behind me have nothing to do with what's going on, but, but they had to be asked to leave the house. And it's my understanding that another reason why there's a construction crew here is because basically law enforcement has to leave this house functioning the way it did when they got here this morning. So depending on what they're taking out, there's a construction crew ready to put it back in. So if they're actually removing pieces, let's say of a floor, which is again what it appeared to me, then there's a crew back here putting that floor back in. So I see that I've got some folks popping up. If anybody has any questions, so yeah, Kelly pointing out, Teresa was a fantastic mom and a wonderful friend. Uh, I, I've heard that from many, many people over the years. I've always appreciated when, when we're working on cases like this, when we get to hear directly from friends and from family. Of course, when we did the Heartland Unsolved, you might have seen that we interviewed Dale Butler, um, who has since passed away. Um, uh, he was very kind to share his time with us. It's always been a very tough situation, as you can imagine, for that family. Um, and so um, I want to stress again that, that uh, he was never considered a suspect in his wife's disappearance, had always cooperated with authorities. Again, unfortunately, Dale passed away last year. Um, but we know that there are family and friends, obviously, staying in, in constant contact with law enforcement, um, waiting for any new updates on this case. So. Um, uh, oh, oh, someone's a prior, uh, Kelly, you must be um, the sheriff's niece when you refer to Uncle Terry. I'm, I'm sure you're re referring to the sheriff, Terry Stevens. Yeah. And, and then you would know this, Kelly, you know, uh, Sheriff Stevens has always taken this case very personally because he's from Risco and that's where Teresa and Dale were living when Teresa went missing. Risco is about four miles from where I'm he standing here in Tallapoosa. 
And so, yeah, this has always been a real high priority case. As the sheriff told me, you know, it happened on his watch. Teresa went missing on his watch. And so um, it, it, it is a very high priority for him and for his department. So he has got his, um, his one of his lead investigators, Captain Chris Hensley, is out here. Um, Highway Patrol Master Sergeant Bud Cooper is also out here. As you know, Hensley and Cooper were uh, instrumental in the solving of the Shear case. Um, and here they are right back at uh, another very high profile cold case and they're here on scene. Um, I'm told they're going to be out here for several hours um, as someone mentioning, Kathy mentioning, we all pray this is solved soon. Absolutely. Um, uh, that is no doubt. And, and again, I think this is just proof positive that this case is, is not considered cold, that, that it's constantly being worked um, as all the cases are here. Uh, throughout Southeast Missouri, frankly, but you know, the investigators here in New Madrid County had uh, three extremely difficult cold cases uh, to deal with and they've solved two of them. And so now this is number three and here we are out here at, at, at a live, uh, a very active scene as they're collecting um, possible evidence again in connection with her disappearance. So we're gonna be out here throughout the afternoon. Uh, if anybody's got any information they wanna share me, message me on Facebook. Um, we'll do another update a little bit later on if we've got some more information. Um, it looks like activity is, not, is, is, is in a bit of a lull. I suspect that uh, a couple of the guys ran out to maybe grab some food. If you've ever been to Tallapoosa, it's a very small town. Um, and uh, so you've got to head into Risco or into a nearby community to find maybe a cold drink or, or a gas station or whatnot. So, um, so thankful that they haven't... Uh, yeah, Teresa deserves justice, Kelly's saying, um, and Melissa's adding prayers for the family, absolutely. Um, yeah, the family deserves to know what happened, and, and that's one thing. When we've profiled this case, um, that's one thing that we're able to learn dealing with investigators is, you know, they, they're not going to give up until they solve a case like this, which is why we appreciate working with them. We certainly appreciated working with Dale um, and with support from the Butler family. So. Um, Again, I think we're going to be out here for a couple hours because once they finish removing whatever they plan on removing from the house, then they've got to put the house back the way they found it. Uh, I'm told there's also a Highway Patrol DNA expert out here as well. Um, so uh, again, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I do expect to hear from the sheriff later today uh, live on Heartland News at 5, so maybe by then we'll be able to get a little bit more information. But, but just to stress, he said they received a tip about possible evidence in connection with Teresa's disappearance inside the home behind me. That's why they're removing pieces of plywood, it would appear, pieces of flooring, it would appear, um, based on the video that we showed you today at noon. So uh, we'll be back with more updates uh, later this afternoon. Uh, as always, we appreciate your support on here and on air as well. Um, we will uh, talk to you soon. Again, this is Kathy Sweeney reporting live from Tallapoosa, Missouri in New Madrid County. I wouldn't want nobody to go through what we've, the family and me and my boys have had to go through. Gone in the middle of the night. What happened to Teresa Butler and why? We feel like it's just, we're just missing a small part of this story to put all the pieces together. Tonight, new clues in a cold case that's captured Heartland headlines for more than a decade. I'm Kathy Sweeney. You know Teresa Butler's story. Now, here's what you don't know. Authorities have a suspect and say they are closer than ever to breaking this case wide open. We've got clues you haven't seen before and an interview you've never heard before with Teresa's husband, Dale. This is In the Dark. It don't seem like it's been 11 years, but it has. And we don't, we don't have any closure. It's not easy for Dale Butler to talk about the moment his world crashed in around him and his young sons. Well, I can see that it's upsetting to him, but I tell him every day that I love him, and the mom would be so proud of him, so proud. Garrett likes uh, photography, like his mother, and Ga Gavin, he looks a lot like her. This is the first time Butler's talked publicly about his wife's disappearance. Not knowing is the hardest part, not knowing what happened or where she's at. 
And so with his help and with the cooperation of investigators who've never stopped working her case, we will walk you through Teresa's final hours and show you never before seen evidence in her case. Tuesday, January 24th, 2006. Dale Butler gets ready for his overnight shift. I gave her a hug and told her I loved her before I went to work. Dale and Teresa are used to the drill, sacrificing time together to balance two jobs and two boys, four-year-old Gavin and two-year-old Garrett. Dale leaves around five o'clock. According to police reports, Teresa takes the boys over to her sister-in-law's house. She's back around 9.30. Her sister-in-law comes back with her to use the family's computer. Teresa says she needs to get the boys to bed around 10 o'clock. Right around that time, Dale tries to call Teresa on his lunch break. And it would just go to voicemail. Like it wouldn't, it wasn't going through. I thought maybe she was just asleep that night. Was Teresa asleep or was she already gone? The next 12 hours so crucial in her case are a blank slate. When I come in, I went in the bedroom and I didn't see Teresa nowhere. And my Gavin was in our bed, balled up in a blanket. Garrett was, Garrett was on a love seat in a soaked diaper with an empty bottle and was awake. And then I went through the house, I went to the bathroom, and Teresa. I went through the whole house saying, Teresa, Teresa. And then I got on my phone and started calling people, thinking maybe she run, went over here, but she, She wouldn't have left them kids there alone. No, no way. No way. Not by herself. Were there signs of a struggle inside her house? No. Nothing looked out of the ordinary other than the kids were there and she wasn't. Officers quickly make an inventory of items missing from the butler home. There was a stereo, the camcorder. A gaming system? That's right, yeah, some kind of video gaming system for the kids. A search of the house also turns up a possible clue. When we looked under the couch, we found a set of ladies' rings, and which we later found out was belonged to Teresa. A lot of times at night, she would take them off. So if she was taking a nap on the couch, it's possible she could have took them off and slid them under there. Or, Sheriff Stevens says, it could have been a more deliberate move. That possibly the people that uh, she was interacting with, she didn't feel completely comfortable with, so she may have been uh, securing them in her own way. Investigators also questioned those closest to Teresa. It was very hard those first few days as they were questioning me pretty heavy and family members, and then I was had the boys trying to take care of them too. It was, it was hard the first few days, first few weeks. Sheriff Stevens stresses Dale Butler's alibi checked out and he has been cleared of any suspicion in his wife's case. But he knows the whispers and the rumors persist. Does it make you mad? Does it make it, you... It's aggravating. It's, it's really aggravating that people would, uh, uh, would assumptions. I know they're just, they're, they're just looking for answers, but we're all looking for answers. All, everybody is. That search for answers would turn up another clue at the Butler home and a crucial piece of evidence pulled from a water-filled ditch. In the Dark continues right after this. I don't think somebody broke in, but somebody somehow they got in. Authorities say it is possible more than one person spent time inside the Butler home in Risco the night Teresa disappeared. And no one believes she willingly left her son's home alone. One clue pointing to how she may have been taken out comes from the Butler's front porch. You know, we had the light bulb that was unscrewed as to not illuminate the porch. And what does that say to you as an investigator when you see a light bulb unscrewed on a front porch? That someone has some type of experience in burglaries, uh, some type of criminal past. That is, uh, you know, his M.O. to do that 
that's one of the things we've been looking for is other burglaries where the light bulb has been unscrewed. A big break in Teresa's case came a year and a half after she went missing, when a tip led authorities to a camcorder dumped in this ditch between Malden and Risco. Sheriff, how'd you find this camcorder? Well, through the investigation, we interviewed an individual who told us a story about uh, exchanging some illegal drugs for a camcorder. And they had viewed the contents of the camcorder after they got it and realized that it belonged to the girl that was missing from Risco, in their words. Teresa Butler. Teresa Butler and her family. Stop filming, please. That witness claims the deal went down within 24 hours of Teresa's disappearance. But with no tape inside the camcorder and no serial number to match it, authorities cannot prove it's the butlers. And while they know who allegedly made the drug deal, they don't have an eyewitness. Is he considered a suspect in this case? Has he been interviewed? What's his status? He is a suspect and we have pursued that person, talked to that person and interviewed him. but. We can't hang our hat on what we know just yet. Have you been able to identify any other possible suspects in her case? We do have a couple more. We're not eliminating anybody at this point in the game. I think about it every day. Why? Why her? Dale Butler deserves an answer. So do their boys. So does Teresa's family. It's why he agreed to this interview. Why everyone who loved Teresa hopes reliving this nightmare will bring authorities that final piece of the puzzle. If anybody knows anything, the, the, it could be the littlest thing to let New Madrid County Sheriff know because it could help solve this case and bring the family some closure. So clearly that drug deal is a big piece of the puzzle, as are the other items stolen from the Butler home that night. Do you think you know something? Please contact the New Madrid County Sheriff's Office. You can also join me for a live Facebook chat on Teresa's case. It will be up on the KFES Facebook page in just a couple minutes. Breaking at six, at last an answer to the question, what happened to Teresa Butler? Good evening from the New Madrid County Sheriff's Office. The mother of two vanished on a cold January night back in 2006. And with the announcement of an arrest of a suspect earlier today, we are learning more about the events that led to Butler's death. 42-year-old Melvin Ray Hufford of Tallapoosa now faces charges of first degree manslaughter and tampering with evidence. Authorities say Hufford admits in injecting Butler with methamphetamine the night she died, hiding her body, then trying to make it look like someone robbed her home. Now, this case has always been a personal one for New Madrid County Sheriff Terry Stevens. He joins us now live. Uh, Sheriff Stevens, I know you're from Risco, which is where Teresa was living when she disappeared. How did you feel when you learned today was the day that someone would face charges in connection with her disappearance? Actually, uh, very relieved, uh, very excited because this has been a long time coming. We've put untold amount of man hours and effort into coming to this end today. You've kept a picture in your office of Teresa since she went missing. Why on a personal level did you take this case to heart the way you did? Well, just like you said, Risco is my hometown. I have a, a bunch of family that lives there, many, many friends that live there. It could have very easily been one of them that this could have happened to, uh, was my thinking at the onset, because we didn't have any idea what the circumstances were. So I took it very personal, and I felt like that entire community was looking to me to solve this. Now, I know that uh, that uh, Hufford's been on your radar basically since day one. How hard was it to get from that day in 2006 to this day in 2019? Extremely difficult. We would get just bits and pieces of information that wasn't necessarily evidence, but would point in a certain direction. And we just had to keep putting it together, keep plugging away at it till we finally got enough. 
I know that you've always stayed in contact with uh, Teresa Butler's family. I'm sure this is a very trying day for them. Um, I, I wanted to give you a, just a moment to, to reflect on Teresa, a, a young mother of two. Um, how difficult has it been to kind of process that information? Well, it's been very trying. Uh, since the very onset of this investigation, uh, one thing uh, rang true throughout that Teresa was a very loving mother and that there was no way under her own will she would have ever walked away from those two children. And that was another reason that we worked so diligently to try to solve it. Sheriff Stevens, thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, Melvin Hufford is currently in the Pemiscot County Jail on unrelated charges. He's expected to be brought here to New Madrid County to face these charges sometime next week. Now, let's join Jeff back in the studio. Kathy, thank you. Coming up in just a little bit, we're going to talk more about this investigation and the group of investigators and detectives solving not only this case, but another huge cold case in the past 13 months.